You know it's time for Tider Insider's Rodney Orr, also Tider Insider TV. It is that time of the year. We're two games in, Rodney. Alabama hung 50 on opponents for the first time in the first two games of the season since 1925. They won 57-7 over Arkansas State on Saturday. It was 40 to nothing at halftime. Uh, give Arkansas some State some credit. They they kept playing and got up to nearly 400 yards of total offense. But your takeaways uh, from game number two, other than the fact that it was really hot, uh, what were some things that you took away from Alabama's uh, second victory of the season? Well, I mean, you know, Gary, it's difficult to tell against Arkansas State, to be honest with you. And they're probably Alabama's probably doing a lot of different things, trying a lot of different things. Uh, you know, we see that sometimes early in the year where they – uh, evaluate, experiment, do some different things. And so I, I really think that it's, it's sometimes it's difficult to tell in, in some of these types of games, but it's, it's clear that they obviously have some, some things to work on. I mean, you know, defensively, I don't think that it was necessarily we talked about 391 yards. I think they piled up a lot of those yards, maybe, you know, after Alabama sure. started doing some substitutions. But, um, you know, again, I, I just think that it's just a, a work in progress as a whole. Uh, I mean, I think you can say that on both sides of the line of scrimmage. I think when you look at the offensive line, they've got a lot of work to do, but they've got a lot of talent. Um, you know, obviously Alabama has some great skill players, make the big plays. They, they ran the football well in the second half, I thought. Najee Harris, it was really good to see him get on track. I thought Damian Harris had some strong runs as well. But, uh, you know, overall it's all there. I just think, again, a matter of putting all the pieces together no doubt about it and uh defensively i mean the first 11 that alabama puts out there quite frankly it doesn't look a lot different to me than what i've seen in years past i mean they look pretty dominant the drop off and where it's noticeable is in terms of depth and of course losing terrell lewis i think is like losing two players because he can he, he can be a defensive lineman he can be an outside linebacker he can rush the passer he can play the run he can defend in pass coverage so that's a huge loss. Lose Chris Allen as well. Uh, how much concern going forward that there seems to be considerable drop-off? And there's no way around it. You can't continue to lose as many players as they've lost on defense and at some point not have it affect you. But, uh, you know, last year you'd bring in the reserves. I didn't notice much difference. This year, clearly, uh, there's a drop-off when they have to go to that bench on the defensive side of the ball. You agree? Yeah, I think so, obviously. Um you know, and again, there's so many inexperienced players even in that first 11. You look in the secondary, there's not, and obviously there's not a lot of depth inside or inside backers. Uh, they're still having to develop some of those guys behind them. And you mentioned Terrell Lewis. You, you just almost imagine what would it have been like if you'd had Terrell Lewis to go in there with Bugs and Raquan Davis and Quinnen Williams. You know, mm-hmm. that has been pretty, really pretty good group right there. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. And I think that, uh, you know, Gary, there is a lot of, like you said, there's a lot. They, ha- I think they're having to develop a lot of younger players this year. And, uh, you know, hopefully as time goes along, uh, you know, those guys will start to, you know, most of them were very highly recruited for reasons. You know, they're very talented, athletic players. So, you know, hopefully as time goes along, they can, uh, you know, develop a, a good group of nucleus in terms of the rotation on that defensive side. You touched on Najee Harris, best game of his career. 13 yard, uh, rushes for 135 net yards. It's over 10 yards a carry. Touchdown in the game, 10.4 average. Damian Harris was solid, 12 for 62. The other guys that ran the ball looked good as well. Quarterback-wise, uh, Tua Tagovailoa, just uh, another marvelous game. 13 of 19, 228, four touchdowns, no picks. Jalen Hurts, 7 of 9, 93 yards, two touchdowns, no picks. Uh, did fumble a ball going into the end zone when he tried to dive over, over – uh, the end zone, but a lot of talk before the game about Jalen's status. Would he play? Would he not play? Would he be redshirted? Uh, a lot of reports out there that he wouldn't play in the game. I contended all along, Rodney, as you know, that he would play in the game simply because that's what the head football coach had said. Uh, the head football coach had not indicated that Jalen wouldn't play. Now, he may come in today and he may say he won't play on, on Saturday, but I never quite understood why people were, were shocked that he played in the game. Uh, what was your takeaway from, from how the quarterbacks were used on Saturday? Well, you know, again, I, I, it, to me, it really doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it's, it's just a conversation that I don't think is really uh, beneficial, to be honest with you. Uh, everybody's got their own opinion. And, uh, you know, why anyone would have been surprised that he played is, is kind of beyond me. Right. Uh, I mean, you knew that they were going to uh, – Alabama was probably going to handle Arkansas State really, really handily. And so why wouldn't he play? Unless, of course – 
there's some sort of an agreement about a red shirt and they wanted to save some games so he could play later. But, you know, I, I, I never really thought that was something that in, in Nick Saban's indicated he's not interested in making s- such an agreement. I mean, he said that a couple right. of weeks ago. Let, let me uh, ask. You know, the only thing that I do think that people wonder is, is the, the timing of putting him in the game. Uh, you know, uh, that's kind of an unusual point. Uh I guess if, if if you look at the way it's normally done, but then again, last year I think there were some games early in the season when when Tua got put in in a very similar That's position. Right. So, uh, you know, we'll see how how it works moving forward. But uh, not surprised that he played. Let, let me ask you this, and and this is just something that I was thinking about this morning, getting ready for the show, because there's been so much discussion. As you said, I can tell you're tired of talking about it. A lot of people are. Um, you got two good quarterbacks. You got two as the starter. That's established. He's playing great. Uh, Jalen led him for two years. He came in. He played very, very well. You know, a lot of people said, well, obviously he's going to transfer. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. Uh, I don't think many people, though, have af- actually asked themselves the question, maybe Jalen doesn't want to transfer, at least right now. Maybe he wants to be a part of this team, even if it's a, as a backup. You know, maybe he wants, he loves Alabama. He, he wants to be here. I just think that's a, a point that no one seems to make. Uh, everybody's talking about, what Jalen's going to do, but nobody has really asked the question, what do you think Jalen wants to do? Maybe he just wants to be on this team. I, I, I've noticed the camaraderie between he and Tua. Uh, they don't seem to have any issues with each other. Uh, the coaching staff seems like they've got a plan for the quarterbacks. The team seems on. I, I think everybody's on the same page other than people outside of the program. And maybe Jalen just wants to be on this football team. Ronnie, do you think that's a possibility? Well, I mean, he stayed. Uh, you know, again, I, I think if you're Jalen Hurts, uh, with, with all of what you said is true, at the same time, you know, eventually he's going to have to make a decision that, that, that's, you know, best for his future, whether that's to stay here and uh, com- continue to try to compete for the job, be the backup, uh, you know, move forward in another uh, program. I mean, all of those things are certainly considerations. Uh, you know, uh, who knows what's going to happen? All we know right now, Gary, is, is he's he's got a role here at Alabama. They play Ole Miss this week, and and everything else is just uh, a bunch of noise. That's right. All right. Speaking of moving forward, that's where Alabama moves on to Oxford, Mississippi, Saturday night, six o'clock at Vault Hemingway Stadium. All right. I went back and watched the highlights of this game. I didn't watch the whole game. Ole Miss scored seventy six points. I don't care who you're playing; that gets your attention. Seventy six forty one. What also got my attention was in the first half. Southern Illinois, as I said earlier on the program, had so many wide receivers running wide open. The quarterback was having to decide who he wanted to throw it to. Uh, I mean, it was brutal. Now they played better defensively in the second half. When you look at this Ole Miss team, clearly their only chance is to score a lot of points. I mean, they're not gonna. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've got to get into a shootout and hope it gets crazy. Uh, just. But they do make you nervous <laughs> with that offense. Yeah. Just, just give me your scouting report on Alabama and Ole Miss. Well, I, I do. You know, I always look at it kind of, you know, in a way of how's this team going to, you know, challenge Alabama. And when you look at those wide receivers that they have, AJ Brown, Metcalf, Demarcus Lodge. Um, you know, they've got that. Uh, I saw the running back against Texas Tech, the kid they recruited out of the JUCO ranks. Um, he looked pretty good too. And I really like their quarterback, Jordan Tom. Uh, he's, you know, I, Gary, I, I don't think they lost anything with Shea Patterson, to be honest with you. I think this kid's, uh, you know, he's done a really nice job. Uh, he's accurate. He can throw the ball down the field. Uh, so, you know, when I look at them offensively, yeah, it kind of scares you because, uh, you know, there's a there's an opportunity there for them to score a lot of points against this Alabama defense. You can't get a pass rush on the guy, these receivers. They're going to be a real challenge for Alabama secondary. Um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens on the flip side of that. I think Southern Illinois had uh, 629 oh, yards. Lit, lit it offense. up. Lit it up, Rodney. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, lit it up. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean you know, you would think that, uh, you know, Alabama will certainly have a lot of opportunities. This, this could be a this could be a high-scoring affair in itself. Um you know, I, I, obviously, I think Alabama's going to win the game, and I think they could win it win it handily. But certainly, it does kind of you get in a shootout like that. I mean, you never really know what can happen. You know, when you're playing against the team at home, that can put up a lot of points. We're two weeks into the season, but we did have SEC versus SEC this past weekend in the East: the Georgia and South Carolina, Florida and Kentucky. A couple of noteworthy wins there. First of all, for Georgia, uh, they went in, and, and I thought this would be a competitive game. I was wrong on this one. Uh, 
all the talk about the East getting better. Georgia's better. The rest of the East just looks like the East to me. I mean, uh, they they rolled South Carolina in Columbia 41-17. Rodney, they got two tough games when they they have to go to LSU and they have to host Auburn. But in that division, do you see anybody being able to slow down no. Georgia? No. no. Yeah. I, I, as a matter of fact, I posted a note yesterday how nice it must be to be Georgia. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Think of, think about it. I mean, Kirby Hart, Kirby Smart inherits a team loaded with players. Don't think that Jeremy Pruitt and Mark Rick didn't leave them any players over there, left them a lot of players. They did lose some this year. Uh, but And then they, they're they loaded with players in the state to recruit. Kirby right. Smart has recruited tons of players since he's been there the last couple of years. And so they, they've got a team, Gary, that, that's really loaded with talent. Um, and they play in a division of a bunch of weak sisters. I mean, that's basically what it is right now, right? I mean, yeah. Florida loses to Kentucky at home for the first time, what, since 1979, I think it was. Um, just doesn't look good. I mean, I, I think obviously South Carolina has made some improvement under, under Muschamp, but, you know, they folded at home, uh, to be honest with you, uh, to Georgia. Uh, I, I just don't really see anyone – you know, right now off the top of my head, I mean, Jeremy Pruitt's got a long, long way to go at Tennessee, although I think he's a really good coach. Uh, uh, he's just got a long way to go. Yeah, so again. I yeah. don't really see anybody. I mean, it's, 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 it's almost like you said, Jerry, kind of like a, a cakewalk. Now, if they get through, um, you know, if, if, if um, Georgia gets through uh, Auburn, and you mentioned LSU, obviously Auburn's later in the year, but, uh, you know, they they – who knows? They may run the table in the regular season. I can see it happen. Well, the, again, it it is the what it is what it is. There are divisions. Somebody gets to represent somebody the East. Somebody gets to represent the West. But there's no doubt you, you have a huge advantage when you're Georgia playing in that division versus Alabama having to play in the West. I mean that is clear. A couple of West games I want to get your uh, thoughts on. A and M didn't win the game, but boy, I thought they showed toughness like we're not used to seeing from A&M. I think Jimbo Fisher's already put his stamp on that team and the fact that he's not in Tallahassee anymore. I think that's obvious too. This guy's a big time coach and A&M's going to have to be dealt with going forward. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to say this. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with the Aggies. <laughs> they're, they're a little bit like Auburn and they've got a lot. They play on emotion. And I'm sorry for the Auburn fans listening, but when Auburn gets on an emotional roll and they kind of get in one of those frenzies down there, they're really hard to beat at home. And I think it's that same kind of atmosphere at Texas A&M. I mean, Gary, they were throwing some – they were playing out of their mind on, in that second half. They had Clemson on their heels. And I do think Jimbo's going to do a good job. And, I'm, I, you know, I'm sure they'll be tougher and have a little bit more physical mindset and all that stuff. But – and I, I'm I'm, I'm going to hold out on the Aggies. I, I'm not sure Clemson is really uh, as good as people think they are. Uh, I'm not really. I, I think Kelly Bryant improved some. I'm not extremely impressed with him uh, overall, though. At this point, um, I think defensively they look pretty good up front, but I, I, I think their secondary. I, last look, when Alabama played in the Sugar Bowl, there were receivers running wide open all over the field, and I mean I think we saw that you know against Texas A&M. So. You know, again, uh, Clemson won the game. I think they're a good team. I think Dabo's done a great job there. Uh, and they'll probably be, as they move along, they're probably going to get a lot better and, and push for the, another playoff berth. But um, Texas a and I, I, I do agree with you, Gary. I think they're, they're going to be an improved program, but I'm, I'm not quite ready to, to jump on the bandwagon complete with, completely with the Aggies just yet. Pumping the brakes just a little bit on A&M. Mississippi State went into Manhattan and rolled Kansas State. Uh, this is a veteran football team, uh, a team that, again, it's because it's Mississippi State, I'm no different than everybody else. I, I just kind of I, I want to believe, but then it's Mississippi State. But uh, they, look, they look pretty sound on both sides of the football. Do you think uh, they have a chance to challenge Alabama in this West Division and, and possibly get to Atlanta? Well, you know, I do because their defensive front is, is really good. Um, you know, they're they're very, very talented up front. Jeffrey Simmons, you know. And, uh, you know, on the offensive side, Fitzgerald's such an athletic guy. He can, can hurt you throwing it, although I know his numbers weren't that great. He missed some guys on, on Saturday. But, uh, you know, he is a threat throwing the football, and he can run. So uh, the, the, the deal is, of course, Alabama plays them here later in the year, but yeah, I think Mississippi State, I don't expect it. But, um, you know, in the West, I'd obviously be much, much more concerned to me 
with with Auburn and and, and maybe even Texas A and M. We'll see how they you know continue to progress. But uh, it, it's a tough tough division. All those teams are certainly going to present challenges. You know that. All right, great stuff from Rodney Orr. You can get more great stuff at TiderInsider.com, just 48 bucks a year, and tune in Tuesday nights at 6.30 for Tider Insider TV. And, of course, he's with me every morning, Monday morning here on the Gary Harris Show. Appreciate it, Rod. Okay, buddy. Thank you.